picked a reasonable salary for me. It was like one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. Everything else we keep in the business bank account. And I use that to either make better videos. I buy better equipment or I'm going to think about hiring more people to basically scale the business up. What's up, Humphrey? Welcome to the Better Wolf Show. Caleb, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. And so you have over 3 million and counting on TikTok. You're coming up on a million subs on YouTube. You have yep. half a million on Instagram. You're now a sub stack expert and you can do a Rubik's Cube on, <laughs> on under two minutes. Dude, it's yeah. an honor to have you on here. And I, I said this as you came on. Um, I don't consume a ton of content. I don't even consume my own mm-hmm. content half the time. And I, I went down the rabbit hole and watched your YouTube videos. And I say this sincerely, every single person that's watching me right now, if you're not subscribed to Humphrey, please do so. We'll have his content on down below. All I ask is that you continue to watch my videos (laughs) because (laughs) you do a phenomenal job and I learned so much and we could talk for days on just the different with the different frameworks and like many like series that you've built on habits, on frameworks, on bad investments. And so, man, I'm excited to have you on here. And uh, so thank you. No, thank you for having me. And that that compliment means a lot, man. I appreciate that. So before we jump into some of the frameworks, because one thing you're going to know about me is I love understanding how people think, not necessarily like Mm -hmm. that, the tactic, but like, what is the, what's behind the tactics? How did you get involved in the financial space? How did you get involved in creating content? I would love to hear like the Humphrey story before you became kind of went viral. Yeah. So I studied finance in college. I never really used it. Uh, I was working for a gaming company right out of college, but a part of me wanted to try finance out just because I, that was my degree. That's what I had in it, you know, partly to please my father. I think my dad wanted me to be like a businessman, finance kind of guy early on. So I got into financial advisory and a little bit of investment banking early in my 20s, and I realized it wasn't really for me, so I just went back to gaming. But uh, after I left that job, basically... I listened to a Naval podcast, you know, Naval Ravikant. And a lot of it had to do with like scale and leverage. It's like, okay, so what can I do that has scale and also leverage as well? So I'm not a coder, right? So I can't really, I can't really get leverage with code. And I, I don't have a ton of capital, so I can't get leverage with capital. But what can I do? I know how to make a good video. Maybe. I know. I knew how to grow an Instagram account at the time because I had like a meme account with like 10,000 followers. So I kind of like knew the social media game a little bit. Uh, apologies if you hear that, by the way. Hopefully you can't. But uh, where was I at? Basically scale and leverage. And so I thought, okay, I can scale with media. And I think I could become pretty good at it. At it. And I really like the idea of like me making a video once, but then being able to be viewed millions of times, right? Because then that meant that I was working a million times, even though I didn't have to be. And so Naval's famous like, example was like back in the day in the 1980s if you wanted to reach a million people you'd have to go do like 50,000 stadium you know a stadium of 50,000 people times 20 or an auditorium of 200 people times whatever that that might be but nowadays with the internet you can just do it once from home and you can be viewed millions of times and I think that's incredibly powerful right yeah Naval is one of my favorite thought leaders I've probably listened to everything he's had put out he actually the one gift, because I, I wanted to give Nate O'Brien something, and he's a reader, so I was like, what, what yeah. should I get him? And I actually got him Naval's book, uh, which Don't, I'm not sure if Don't he's read it yet, but it is by far in the top five books I've ever read. I, I've read it multiple times, and one thing that I love about about Naval, and I give him credit for this, is I have this framework called the value leveraging. I believe in any business that you get into or any investment, you have to understand the underlying value, the service or product, and all services or products are have perception of value. But then if you really want to become wealthy and influential, you need to apply leverage, which is not just mm-hmm. other people's money, but it could be influence, it could be platform, okay, it so could be media, it could be code. And so at the end of the day, love, love that you mentioned that. And I yeah. am a re- I'm a I'm a result and product of of Naval and, and he really much encouraged me to keep doing the podcast, even though like very few people listened early on. And so love that dude. Yeah, I mean, I am too. And I think I could rename this the Better Naval Show. I don't know. But uh, definitely, like, I've definitely listened to that podcast of his five or six times. I've read The Almanac a few times. I don't know if that's the book you're talking about. Yep. But um, his principles are timeless. And I think that 
maybe they were understood by me innately early on, but he really just was able to put it into words yeah. and then a word that I could study. And I thought that was really interesting. So that's, I love that. That's where well, I'm at now. Thank, yeah. you for, uh, thank you for saying yes to the coffee. <laughs> uh, and anyone yeah. that follows him uh, knows that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's at a coffee shop right now when uh, yep. you should say no to coffee meetings. Um, let's, let's jump into like getting started in, in the whole YouTube and, and social media. I believe you started on short form and yep. took off there, but talk to me about like, okay, this is what you're going to do. Why did you choose personal finance? And when was the day that you went viral that you were like, I'm, I'm addicted to this whole thing. Yeah. So I'll take you to the Genesis, which is I've always loved personal finance. I always give all my friends advice about what they should be doing with their money or how much they should be spending, stuff like that. So I've always been kind of like a personal finance geek. I've been like on the Reddit for personal finance for a long time. Um, and I actually started off with three YouTube videos. So not many people know that, but in 2019, I tried three YouTube videos. And I was definitely inspired by like Graham Stephan, right? And so I, I used to watch a lot of Graham in 2017 or maybe 2018. And I was like, okay, I want to try it too, because I feel like I know just as much as he does. Maybe I know a little bit more about certain areas. He definitely knows more about real estate than I do, but I wanted to give it a try. So I made three YouTube videos. They went nowhere. And then at the end of 2019, I noticed TikTok was kind of getting big. A lot of teens were watching it. And so I said, okay, let me check how many people are making personal finance videos on TikTok. And I checked for the hashtag personal finance. It was like no videos. There was like 10 maybe at most. And they weren't good. And so I kind of like knew from like the the conversations that I've been kind of having and also just the entrepreneurship stuff I was like listening to that if you're first to market, it's obviously going to be a good thing. So I just started kind of making videos there. Um, at the end of 2018, my goal was to make 30 videos in 30 days. And so I accomplished that. And I think by the 12th or 15th video, I, I think that was the first viral moment and uh, never looked back since. But it was it was a video about the supply chain of a hydro flask and i was just showing to the audience like okay this is the exact supply chain this is how much you could actually get this good from china if you have bought it in like thousands right and so people didn't really understand that every good that you see in america or anywhere really when you buy it there's a huge margin associated with that and that there's going to be costs along the way but the actual good itself is going to be a tenth of what you actually pay for right what i would love is is before we jump into all the frameworks as a content creator, what are the different areas you make money? You don't have to give your specifics. I would just love to know from a content bucket standpoint, what what is in your mind as it relates to being a content creator and how do you make money? Yeah, so I can talk about my business model and I can tell you about some other finance creators' models. But basically mine is AdSense is about 40 to 50% of my revenue and then sponsorships is probably like 30 to 40% and then the rest is affiliate. And so those are my three main income sources. Um, I'm trying to monetize my newsletter next, either with a premium subscription or perhaps I can upsell a certain product, but I don't have any products out. And so that's another barrier to me too. But basically it's those three primary sources. Sometimes I do get some, you know, some, some speaking engagements, but I would just categorize that as sponsorships as well. Um, I know that some other successful creators out there, like especially in finance, they have a much bigger affiliate business than I do. Like sometimes affiliates make up half of their income or more. And that's because they're literally linking out to like really lucrative affiliates. So if you think about tax software, you're thinking about, I don't know, uh, FTX. <laughs> yeah, FTX. <laughs> but there are some more, there are definitely lucrative affiliate programs out there. Um, I just, for me right now, it's a, it's a heavy focus on content. So that's why you see so much of my revenue being driven by accents. And and dude, you're playing the long game because you're building attention. So I'll, I'll share my numbers. Sure. You don't have to share yours, but I have 3,000 watch hours, okay. okay, for the whole month. Okay. Now, if you do the math on that, that's 400 plus eight hour days. Like that, yeah. like that blows that's my crazy. mind. Like that's crazy. That, like that's, that's leverage upon leverage, but like, I'm telling you, that's a drop in the bucket, yeah. what you experience. And so whenever you come up with a product, get into business, or you believe in something so much that you want to to actually promote it to the attention that you have, what you're doing right now is you're, you're deferring, but you're deferring and building up uh, for a, a larger exit, as some people would say in the business space. And so what you're doing is really, really smart. You're just playing the long game, whereas a lot of people don't have the patience for that. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Half the time, it's not even me trying to play a long game. It's just I haven't had a great idea to monetize the back end. And so I was really commending you and like, 
you know, you said you had however many units this month, but you, you did a million dollars a day. Like, that's crazy. That just means your back end is so good uh, compared to your content side. And I'm almost like the direct opposite, if you think about it, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, spent, I spent five and a half years building a business. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of times, like, there was a lot of sacrifices living at home, yeah. you know, doing a lot of things to not build an audience, but to build a business. And so the grass is always greener on the other yeah. side. I'm happy and grateful with where I'm at. I'm now headed into seeing the importance of attention. That's like the lever. Yeah. But for me, I started with the value machine and now I'm creating the lever. And I think for you, you you created massive leverage by being valuable. And now if you if you provide a product or a service before that in that framework, um, my friend, you are uh, <laughs> on your way to do some pretty good things. So. Um, anything you want to say before we jump into some of the uh, money frameworks and uh, videos that you've created? No, let's jump into that. I love I love talking about that stuff anyway. So first question I have is, what is your most favorite topic to talk about? Investments, good investments, bad investments, habits. I know you just have a phenomenal video on the framework of savings and how you can find money and what you should be saving. What what is some of your favorite topics to talk about on a podcast like this? Gosh, my, one of my so one, one of my most favorite videos I put out this year was how to go from zero to 100k, and I think that a lot of people don't understand that making your first 100k is usually coming from savings, not really so much investments. Yeah, you can invest your way there, but the majority of it is just going to be habits, right? Your personal financial habits that get you to save more to get you to that 100k hurdle. But then once you get to that 100k, it's like expanding your wealth and compounding that. I love talking about that. So, so let's talk wow. about that because I, I have, I believe that the number one asset that you have in your life is yep. yourself, your ability to create value and earn. We both know, and we both have friends that have make a lot of money and keep none of it. Yep. Okay, so saving is the is the thing that you need to do to actually have a hundred thousand. Um, I'm in the camp of if you're not making hundred thousand or more, like focus on how to do that, um, and then obviously learn how to save and keep that as well it yeah. kind of but it's like the one two mm-hmm. punch where are you there and then tell me maybe the cliff notes of that video from a standpoint of some of the things that like your biggest takeaway on to get that hundred thousand in, in savings. yeah i think a big takeaway was like yeah you we all have that friend who makes 200 or 300 grand a year and you know that they live paycheck to paycheck or they don't save anything right and so at that point it's like if that person that making 200k a year is not saving any of it if you make 60k a year and you save save 10k a year like you're you're technically saving more than he is or she is, and you're going to be building your compounding your wealth a little bit faster than, than that person. Um, I do agree with you. Like, if you're not making enough, you got to focus on trying to make more income. But whenever I say that, that kind of falls on deaf ears, especially among the audience, because it's like someone might be stuck in a really tough job where they're working 50 hours a week yep. and they're, they're like, okay, screw you. Tell me to make more income. Like, I'm barely surviving here, right? So it's always kind of, that's a, a it's a delicate kind of line to toe. Um, but I'm a firm believer that even if you're making not that much money, it, it really comes down to your savings rate. If you can save, you can, you might be able to get yourself out of that situation. It might take you a little longer than someone else who's, you know, who's making over 100K, sure. But I, I always think that discipline is, is going to be really important. Um, obviously, easier said than done. And obviously, I'm in a better position or I'm in a position that I can say that. Where I don't don't really have to worry about the day to day as much. Like I I've never really been in a situation where like I'm scrounging paycheck to paycheck, right? So I can't really empathize with those people. I I've tried and I try to put myself in their shoes, but the reality is is that I'm not gonna know exactly what that feels like. So I can only give you general insights on what I would do, but I don't actually know if that would actually play out. <laughs> For me, so I always Thanks. tell tell the audience to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Uh, yeah, and one of the one of the things that I mention, like when I speak, especially to entrepreneurs, because the number one thing that entrepreneurs will say is, "I'll just make more money." Yeah, and a five percent savings rate. If you save thirty thousand, now thirty thousand could be through tax savings or just saving sure. more. That's an equivalent of you making an additional three hundred thousand dollars, not changing your savings rate. So yeah, what's easier, make three hundred? Or save to, and and do both. By the way, like I'm not saying either yeah, or, yeah. but it's just like that puts in perspective to be like saving a dollar is actually more valuable than making because making there's a lot more drag and it doesn't change a habit. Um, and so I I love that message and um and and I also love the empathy that you have to say. Listen, I've never been you know choosing between should I keep the lights on and actually hit my right. monthly savings goal 
And I, I'll be in the same boat is I lived at home and did certain things so that I could say mm. to invest in business and all that stuff. But I've really had it easy as well. And I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. And then I think on the flip side, what you just said was really important. I think as on entrepreneurs make more money, they tend to spend a ton more money and they're just like, oh, it's okay. I'll make more because they have kind of an income generator. Right. And so like, I know a YouTuber spends basically his entire, you know, monthly income. Right. Or like, you know, started to buy a house or buy his fancy things. It's like, okay, well, if you're trying to really compound your wealth, you want to get to 10 million as quickly as possible. I, that's my, that's my personal ethos. It's like, yeah, you might be making a million a year right now, but if you're spending 500K a year while you're making a million, you're going to delay your compounding to get to that 10 or that 20 million number you want, where it really just starts to compound so much that you don't really have to do anything. But basically people outspend their income all the time. And that, that goes for every income level, in my opinion. And, and even at yeah. the higher income level, like, yeah, what you said was really powerful. You can save 30,000. That's, that's incredible, right? So it's, it's almost like being disciplined, even as you make more money, it is hard. It's harder in my, in some, in some cases. Yeah. What, what you'll find is that there's, again, I'm a, I have a framework for everything. So when you make a dollar, uh -huh. you're, I believe money is only capable of doing two things. It can be either saved, which is a verb to hopefully be invested. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or it's consumed and I don't care if it's at a Starbucks, I don't care if it's on a car, I don't care if it's via taxes. Think of your consumption as your current lifestyle and at the end of the day, taxes is to keep you out of jail, so that's part of your lifestyle, if you, you know? So it's like, at the end of the day, the way, it's like once you make a dollar, the two, the, we can either focus on, like, that money can only do two things and when it's saved, hopefully we can invest it well or we can reduce or be efficient, removing friction from our consumption, our current lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So. Let's look at both of those areas because I think you have a lot to say in both of those areas. When it comes to consumption, where do you th see people being super inefficient? And what do you know that can maybe put, potentially put money back in people's pockets on what they're currently losing every month, day in and day out? Like, What are some efficiency hacks that they can apply that if they know these things, they can free up more money to hopefully save and invest? I mean, a big thing for most people that especially my viewers is like, they don't track their expenses. So first of all, they don't even know where their dollar is going. Right. And like knowing where it's going is half the battle. It's like, once you know, you're kind of like more aware of exactly where you can save. It's almost like you're trying to lose weight, but you don't know what you're putting in your body. Like if you're just like eating whatever all the time, you kind of lose track of what you've eaten that day. And the same thing goes for spending. It's like, sometimes you just forget about these little things here and there. But at the end of the month, if you see that they add up to I don't know, $300 a month, like that could be something you should be looking at. So a lot of people are too afraid to face their expenses. I think it's like a guilt thing. They feel guilty about what they're consuming uh, or they don't want, they don't want themselves to know what they're consuming. It's like they have two sides of their self that they don't really want to face. If that makes sense. It's almost like thoughts versus yeah. who I am. Um, in general though, what I see most people spending too much money on dumb stuff buying like dumb stuff you know fast fashion is really big uh eating out way too much when they do eat out they opt for you know a couple extra drinks here and there like you know basic basic logical things that people spend too much money on uh that's preventing them from getting their savings goals it's usually not someone that i meet that's like not taking full advantage of their tax write-off that's usually someone who already kind of understands their personal finances yeah. already is making it decent and start starting to think about tax write-offs, it's usually a lot of my audience probably makes under 75K a year. So their biggest problems are overspending typically. Got it. Yeah. I, when, I, when, so I wanted to know your framework. You know, you said a dollar, you can either save or consume it. Do you have like a rough proportion that you like to see? Yeah. I mean, so we actually have a model. So this is a whole nother conversation. We actually uh, can model any financial situation. And based on your age, because the biggest the biggest lie is that people will say, oh, you have to save 10 percent or 20 percent. Well, it's it's an input and output. If you're 10 years old, you and based on a, let's say, 8 percent growth rate, because there's always assumptions in these models. But we can actually mathematically model with two lines based on your consumption and savings when when you'll run out of money or if you can maintain your current standard of living. So we actually I believe. If you really want to be accurate with these things, you need to put a model mathematically behind it. And so 
someday I can show you that and I would love to get your feedback on that because I think it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, and what you'll find is a, a lot of people are not saving nearly enough and uh, quite frankly, it can get depressing when you're in your 40s or 50s and, and you haven't started and you start looking. It's like you we either need to take unnecessary risk potentially, we need to save a significant amount of money or what most people have to do is just work longer. And so one of the things that I try to encourage people is like do work that you love um, yeah. because the idea of retirement is can be very depressing, especially if you if you hate your life or you hate your job and then you realize like, oh, you actually can't quote unquote retire. So I'm a big fan of living living life intentionally and uh, but mathematically modeling what's going on so that we can be realist. And what I share with people is three, really there's three categories. It's track your money. I 100% agree. When you track your money, you better control it. It's like tracking your sleep. It's yeah. like I am more conscientious of sleep. Why? Because I try, not because I'm a PhD in sleep. It's like I actually track every every night. And so it just makes me more aware. And then when you track it, the one question I would ask is, are you spending money that you really value? And if we don't, if we don't know our values, whole nother video, that's a whole nother conversation. But what you find is a lot of people are spending money to impress people they don't even like. Yeah. And as a result, their values are either built up on other people or they have never even thought of that. So that's number one. Number two is I think debt. I think understanding good debt versus bad debt, understanding credit. There's a lot of efficiencies there. And a lot of people just don't know how to think about debt as a tool. And a lot of people are in bad situation with debt. And then the third area for us is taxes, because for the people that a lot of times we serve, they aren't optimizing taxes. They're paying, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 plus dollars a year in tax. And it's because they haven't applied a strategy. So those are like the three areas um, that we go into when we look at consumption. Sounds like me. I pay too much in tax. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, too. <laughs> hey, I I, uh, I have a tax savings for you. Uh, move out of California. I uh, know, seriously. <laughs> I know. I've been advised that many times. Uh, I'm thinking about it too. Yeah. So. So, so let's talk about let's talk about money that you do save. You did a video on savings. Um, yeah. you know, you you recommended. I think in your video you said that the top one percent saves thirty eight percent. Yep. Of and that that's depressing for a lot of people seeing that. I I think it's awesome. Yeah. Thirty percent, by the way, is a good number if you're in your mid 20s 30s like if you want to be you can save 30 percent. you don't have to take crazy unnecessary risk like your model is going to be good so talk about that and then talk about where you're investing your money and how you're thinking um about that yeah i i thought those statistics were pretty fascinating to me um for some reason i think 38 percent is a is a huge savings rate especially for the top one percent even the top 10 percent had a pretty high savings rate i forget what it exactly was um my personal philosophy is that as long as I'm tracking how much I'm spending, again, it comes back to tracking, but I have basically a calculator, right? And I have a Google spreadsheet every time, every month, because my income is variable, what happens is I put in my income for the month and then I put in what my spending was for that month. And it tells me exactly how much of a percentage of, of, of net income I spent. So usually you know if if it's you know less than 50 percent, that's great that means i'm saving more than 50 percent of my net income i really care about net income and net savings and so usually when i when i do have that savings i it basically gets automatically you know uh transferred to three different places one retirement account two brokerage account and then three just like liquid cash savings and that's that's because i'm you know i'm saving to try to buy a home in the future so I just have automatic automatic transfer set up, but at the end of every month, if I have extra savings than what I anticipated, I kind of manually move those into those three different buckets. Um, the savings is sitting in the high yield savings account right now, and then the brokerage account still has some uninvested cash just because I like having uninvested cash in the sideline sometimes. And then the retirement accounts are pretty much set up, the Roth IRA or an IRA and then backdoor it, or uh, and that's basically it, yeah. Um, and is most of your money in, went in like index funds, low cost? Yeah, it's, I have a video about what's in my portfolio. It's mostly index funds, but I like to dabble in some tech stocks. And so I should really okay. just consolidate all into index funds because it, I do like buying stocks and investing, but I'm not looking at it every day. And so I really think that for me, it's just better if I just focus on content, which is my main income source right now. And to really just 10x that. And if I can do that, then... The investing will just take care of the compounding on its end, on its own. Um, yeah. 
I had one more thought. I lost it, but maybe I'll come back. It's uh, it's interesting when you look at like Warren Buffett and others. They're obsessed about not making a greater rate of return, but making the same return that the market does by reducing risk. Mm. Is there anything that you do to reduce your exposure or risk um, and try to take Warren Buffett's number one rule, don't lose money? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, that is something I don't do right now, but after you just said that, I probably should take a look at my portfolio and see what is a little bit too risky because I, I definitely agree with you. I think I've been burned for years just taking on too many risky type of stock investments and they've actually hurt my portfolio by quite a bit. And so had I just been in indexes, I probably wouldn't buy a dollar the better last year, for example. Um, is that what you're trying to say? do you invest... Yes. Yeah. How much do you invest in your business? Because I would argue that majority of your cash flow that you create is because you invest in your business, which is yourself. Yep. Do you do you just do you see yourself like do you actually set aside money to reinvest in your business, yes. or do you just see that as part of your lifestyle? Yes. So I have a draw every month. So basically, I take a salary out of uh, out of the business, but usually I don't take more than that draw. Right. And so I I picked a reasonable salary for me. It was like one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. I take that out of the business every single month. So every single month, I, I take that out. I pay my one full-time employee. He makes about 60, 65K a year. And then everything else, we keep in the business bank account. And I use that to either make better videos, I buy better equipment, or I'm going to think about hiring more people to basically scale the business up. But right now, I have a good war chest in my business bank account. I like to keep it that way. Obviously, if it gets a little bit too high, I might withdraw some money from it in the high yield savings. But right now, it's at a really good amount. I think I have enough runway for probably 12 to 24 months in the business bank account. And I just kind of just sit there. I kind of want to see it grow bigger. But then I kind of think of, I guess, the money in the business bank account. I think of it like little soldiers. So like, how can I deploy these little soldiers in a way that gets me more return in the future? And then I did, I did remember yep. my earlier point, which was, I also set aside money for taxes. So like out of every hundred dollars I make, I try to set aside $40 to taxes too. And I 40 is an overestimation, but it just keeps it so that I don't spend that money at all. Yep. I, I, I love that. That's, that's why we are kindred spirits. Um, <laughs> I also, I also have a year's worth of reserve Yeah, and it's, and it's because of two things. I believe you can make freer content and actually be more authentic if you don't if, if you don't need that video to work it's like sales 101 yeah 100 you could be better at sales you could be better at business mm -hmm. if you don't need that thing people can sense it and i think uh i think it's very much number one for where you're at but it's just i think it's smart business so congratulations i, I believe do. more businesses should have reserves and it, i love the, like when inflation was happening everyone's like they think like money's just gonna like burn a hole in their pocket and they're just like losing liquidity and control. And I just, I, I knew that so many of our friends, so many of my, my business friends because of inflation are now in a really tough spot mm. because they don't have control and liquidity of their money. And so here's right. the question, what is the rate of return of zero? I yeah. think for everyone that's different, I think everyone needs to know what the rate of return of control is in their life. Yeah. For me, peace of mind is huge, right? So I don't have any debt on my car, right? I only have one car, but it's paid off. And, and every time I think, every time I even take on a subscription, I'm thinking about, okay, will this actually like give me a headache to think about in the, in, in the back of my mind? Like, okay, like, is this extra expense every single month going to tell me? Like even my rent, right? Like if I'm thinking about my rent, like, okay, can I afford that? Is that, is that going to be such a splinter in my mind that it starts to basically inhibit my decision-making ability? Um, and the, it, hopefully the answer is no. And so... Yeah. Back to your point is I've noticed that every time I optimize for long-term decisions, like 10 years out in the future, 15 years out in the future, I usually perform a lot better and you make, you make more sound decisions when you're not really having a gun to your head about money. Right. So that's, that's the reason for the war chest, uh, <laughs> the reserves and the business bank account. But I think that's also true for just your personal life too. You're going to make better decisions when yeah. you, when you're not really, you know, compromised or. I guess what the word is, is uh, draft for cash, draft for cash at that point. Yeah. Yeah. What is your thoughts on, uh, I would love to know your framework for good debt versus bad debt and credit cards. Obviously you have videos. We yep. have great friends of ours that are credit card, you know, 
gurus. What's your thoughts overall on credit card hacking? Do you think it does more good or do you think it actually hurts people in the long run um, because they're overspending to hit certain certain um, benefits? I think credit card hacking does really good for those people that earn so much money that they and they keep track of all the credit card points. They're almost like OCD about the credit card points. Those people, the churners, I like to call them, they probably do just fine. But the average person trying to learn to credit card hack, I think they might spend a little bit more than, than they can chew. And then they end up carrying a balance month over month. And then at that point, I think it's it's uh, it's kind of like not productive. I, I would say if you can keep a zero balance every single month on your credit cards, credit card hack as much as you want, basically. like Because then at, at that point, it's, the odds are in your favor. But... Once you carry a balance, even for a month, even if it's just like a hundred or two hundred dollars, like that, that hurts. Like that kills your ROI. And credit card hacking is so, the margins are so small, slim that if you really want to take advantage of that, you really got to have zero balance. I missed your other. That what's your what's your framework on, what's your framework on good debt versus bad debt? Like how do you how do you know? Because debt, like yeah, I guess I want to hear your thoughts before I put my own agenda on it. I think any any debt that you take on that can give yourself a return eventually, that's probably better debt, right? So like investing in yourself. You take a class and all of a sudden you you owe or like you take education, right? And you owe fifty K on, on some sort of educational course or educational class that you did for that year. As long as it can provide an ROI in the I'd say in the midterm, I think that's good debt. Um there's what are some other good debt that you you personally employ? Well, I I think of debt as as a tool because if you look at our cash, it's a form of debt. It's currency. It's called Federal Reserve note. So whether you yeah. pay cash or use debt, we're you we're in a debt based society. So it really comes down to if you use a debt, is your net worth in, influenced? Is your cash flow influenced? And what does risk do? So I believe mm-hmm. a mortgage, a thirty year mortgage, is actually reduces your risk, increases your net worth, and increases cash flow. And people are like, well. Because you have a mortgage, you're at more risk. If I could pay cash for a house or get a 30-year mortgage, I would actually be less at risk doing the 30-year mortgage because if I get disabled or lose my job, mm. guess who doesn't like to lend me money? Banks. Right. So so I actually look at debt. I would only use debt if I could increase my cash flow because of it, increase my net worth, and reduce my risk. And in a lot of cases, it's an opportunity cost of if I use debt as a tool what is else is opening up. And so in a lot of cases, um, that's how I view debt. I view it very differently than like, don't don't use debt to buy a car. I, I actually, oh, interesting. To- you know, back back in interest rate days, it's like, if you're going to buy a car, decide on that car. Don't, sometimes debt enables you to buy something you shouldn't. But, but then if you could get a 2% car loan, which aren't available today, but a 2% car loan, it all comes down to, is that 2% car loan freeing me up to have a greater net worth, have more cash flow, and reducing my risk. That's how I think about that. I guess that's a that's a way that I haven't really thought about it before. But what you just brought up, the mortgage example, is a really good, a really good example. Um, growing up in a tiny yep. family, like we're just really taught, and you know, we're made to it's not debt. Basically, like, oh, this guy's taking me on debt. That's a bad thing. And I think that, right? For me, I personally haven't explored enough about debt to understand the best strategies around good versus bad debt. Obviously, we don't want bad debt, credit card debt, right? That's just dumb. But but good debt, like mortgage debt, in your specific case, I haven't really thought about that in that way. So I'll have to I'll have to do some research and think about that a little bit more. I think it's I think I think well, what you said I'll is be looking for a video. I think I think uh, I think you doing a breaking down the pros and cons of a mortgage, I think would be a, a fun video to watch on your channel. So um, yeah, man, I got uh, so I, I do Mark. want to address something. I think this will be fun. Sure. I'm actually going to do a reaction to one of your videos. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, so you have a video that talks about the five terrible places to put your money. You have, and it's a great video. I recommend every single person watch it. You remember what your third one was? It was it was whole life insurance. Oh yeah, whole life. And, yeah, yeah, whole life, whole life. And here, here's the deal. I actually am probably the most critical person on life insurance. And it's funny okay. because our main business is selling permanent life insurance. So just straight up. Okay. But majority of people, I would say 98% of whole life, index universal life, any permanent life insurance that's sold, complete garbage, horrible commissions, horrible mm-hmm. break-evens, 
you you would actually be better off putting your money in a zero percent savings account, right? And and having having it sit there. Ironically, I can also say that I put over six figures a year into life insurance, which might shock you. Um, shock, and so I would just yeah. love to hear your thoughts. I would just love to hear your thoughts on life insurance. I'm gonna break down your video because I was like, I watched it and I was like, this is such a good video and it gives me more talking points to address. Um, so I, I couldn't I couldn't leave this interview without even addre addressing that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on life insurance um, on that. So that video is definitely aimed toward the general population, right? So I don't know what kind of strategies you're employing with your permanent life insurance that are gonna make it worth it. But I would say for the average consumer watching that video, that's trying to be sold a whole life insurance plan from like, you know, Southeastern Mutual. I'm not going to name them, but no, you know what I mean? Like the, the yeah. directional compass directional uh, company, it's probably a bad idea. Right. And, and, yeah. and they also get sold the cash value thing. They get sold on that all the time. And it's just, it's just not worth it when you run the numbers. I don't know all the different types of insurance and I'm definitely not the most foremost expert in life insurance, but I do know that those are usually not good for the average person. And that's what I was trying to target with that video term a little bit okay with just because it's, it's really straightforward to understand your monthly premiums aren't going to be killing you. I kind of like it for that reason, especially if you want life insurance, but yep. I don't know what your strategy is with permanent life insurance. So I'm definitely looking forward to the video and I would definitely like to see the other side because I'm, ha I'm willing to have like a really healthy discussion about these. It's not like I need all insurance people, yep. but, but, uh, that's just my general understanding of it. And so it yep. comes from a very bird's eye view. And so I'm not, I don't know that it's yep. ready about insurance. The, it, like anything, like you, we, we could take Dave Ramsey and it's like, you could take his advice and you could be super critical of it. Mm -hmm. But if you actually zoom back, you're like tons tons and tons of people, millions and millions of people have been impacted by his work and are living more debt free. And like, yeah, I could be critical on some things and be like, he's just defied his logic. Well, at the end of the day, I am like, I have a ton of love for Dave Ramsey. I know that might come as a shock to some people because I can be critical on some things, but like he's done way more good than I, I have ever done in my life. And yeah. so I aspire to be on his level. I think the same thing with um, with what what we teach is if if I had to do a general message to the public, I wouldn't even mention anything life insurance because I agree with you. Majority of people should not even look at it. Majority of people will not be better off having it. And I've seen many people, many people worse off because of that product. And so that's that's what I'm going to be addressing in the video because I actually agree with you. And I'm going to share a different perspective coming from the space that, um, you know, has a whole business doing permanent life insurance, which might sound weird. So all that, I just, I want to, I want to let you know, I, I have a ton of, ton of love and respect. Yeah. You know? And I always have an open mind to things. So like, even if I say one thing's wrong one day or like, you know, I would never do one thing. I, I'd like to pride myself on the idea that if I can see the other point of view and it makes sense to me, I'm willing to reverse my, my opinion on it. Right. So it's not just like, it's not going to fall on deaf ears if you, if you make that video and I, I learned it and I learned more about it. Well, dude, I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything else that, I mean, we, we covered a lot. My hope is that my viewers and people that are listening to this on the podcast can go subscribe to your YouTube. You have Thank a you. phenomenal email list that I just subscribed to. Thanks. Um, what else is on your mind? Like how, how can people like be better off for like being in your world? And is there anything else that you didn't mention that you're like, Hey, I, I want to share this because this is a video I'm working on, or I read this, it just changed my life. Like we didn't even get into the 24. CEO habits and all those other oh, yeah, things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your video. Man, I don't know. I think I'm just trying to innovate more on the financial YouTube side. And so sometimes I'll put out a video that I know won't do that well off the bat, especially to my audience who's just kind of looking for a talking head where I go through some data and some facts. But I think that financial YouTube is missing somebody that can make sense of financial topics, but also make them entertaining and fun to a wide appeal right like you kind of have that with dave ramsey sometimes and you kind of see that with graham sometimes on some of his topics but a lot of times like you know i think about and I, I think about one of my friends who, who hates personal finance like how can i get her to watch a money related video so i've been trying to do more broad video ideas I, my next video idea is like does money buy you happiness because there's been a new study published that says it actually does and the age old 
wisdom was that if you made more than 75k a year there was diminishing returns but they actually reversed their study and so i'm trying to make this video as entertaining as possible and so i would just say if you are listening and you, you want to watch that and see me experiment with different video types in finance i hope that you enjoy that it's not going to just all be the same I don't, I don't really like just doing the same thing over and over and i try not to click things so that's another right and and the youtube algorithm hates that they want you to make yeah. the same dang video every single time and they and they punish you yeah. going outside the box and i appreciate you for doing that they, um, they do are you all <laughs> right. right yeah um they they reward you going outside the box they reward no. you doing the same thing they reward you doing the same thing yeah for yeah. sure yeah i'm with you man i'm in i'm in that and a micro scale for versus where you're at but yeah. um I'm breaking out and I'm, I'm definitely sometimes feel it. Um, let me ask you this. Are you, are you thinking about starting a business or what does that, what does that next 24 months look like? Are you going to continue to build an audience? And I think my next 24 months has definitely become the biggest financial YouTuber that I can be. So I have some big video ideas that I'm trying to hit 5 million views on each video for. We'll see if that actually happens. But uh, a business is definitely in the in the future for me. Like I've always said that I would make a business if I had a clear insight about whatever I could offer, right? And so that insight really hasn't struck me yet. There are some things I think I could kind of improve upon in the financial space. Just just looking at what you know what my audience needs and kind of like using the YouTube channel as as leverage to kind of get it kick started. But really, I haven't found anything like spectacularly crazy that i can kind of kind of create right now so we might have to have some more chats offline and, and talk about that but for now i yeah definitely focus on content but definitely want to create a business off of off of the youtube channel eventually yeah for sure i think it's incredible man last question for you totally switching the subject right. here but let's say this is your last day on earth oh, and God. you're with the okay. people that you love the most and you okay. can't give them any of your videos. You can't give them the balls work. You you have one last conversation with them. What would you yeah, share in that hard. last conversation? Uh, this is my last day on earth. And you're with the people you love the most. I mean, besides telling them how much I love them and stuff like that. Gosh. Like, like wisdom or what? Yeah, what piece, of, piece of wisdom. Like, how are you going to leave, dude? How, I, what, what, what? Guys, you, really you really like me in here. Actually, here. Uh, I think that, my, so I've been doing a lot of meditating in the last like two months. And that the, the one thing that I've noticed is like, you are not your thoughts and your thoughts are often I mean, your thoughts come and go and there's millions of thoughts every single day or thousands of thoughts every single day, but you yourself are not them. Like, it's almost like, I think I've got like two different parts of me, right? My thoughts, which are just like constantly kind of going, but then is is completely different sometimes. So I, I don't know. I guess I would just tell them like, your thoughts are not you. And sometimes you could have bad thoughts and they they're just like kind of passing ships. So they're, they're like ships passing in the night. You can recognize them as they're there, but then the good thoughts, they're there as well. And so you kind of have to kind of, you're always filtering through your thoughts. Uh, gosh, that's such a bad answer. I'm so, I'm so uneloquent when it comes to this. I really haven't thought about it. It's really making me existential no, and about I, what I would do in my last day. No, and I and I appreciate that, and it's actually I I do this for my guests because it gets us to be more in, intentional. But I actually love what you're saying because a lot of times we take the input in what people like in our input or our perception, yeah. and we make that define us, and that that can be a really ugly thing. So, dude, I appreciate your answer, and um, I I know the fact that you've been meditating, and um, we definitely have to have more chats offline about. Um, what, what you're learning through that, because there's some people very close to me that have started those practices. And I, and I, uh, I think it's very, I think it takes a lot of discipline and they're definitely, um, I'm, I'm seeing results for them really taking time and quieting the voices. And, um, everyone has a little bit different approach to doing that, but man, I appreciate you. Cool. I'm going to be watching you. Thank you. And, um, I look forward to seeing what the future holds, man. I appreciate it, Caleb. Thanks for having me on the show.